Welcome everybody to another Jump Music Initiative podcast. Um, we are really excited to have our, our, our guest this week and I'm going to let Maddie uh, take the introduction from here. Yeah, sounds good. Welcome, Paul. And I'm just going to read a few highlights off of your bio to give our viewers a little bit of an understanding about what you do. So Paul's background starts in television. He worked at CTV and then he decided to he decided to start on his own and started an entertainment company called Advance Entertainment. He worked on big projects like the 18th month run of Rain, a tribute to the Beatles on Broadway in New York, most recently working on musicals by Queen, We Will Rock You, and Foreigner, Jukebox Hero. As a musician, Paul has played a number of, with a number of bands with local successes, including four top 10 college radio songs in the 80s. Paul continues to play music gigs regularly, and he also is working on an album right now. <laughs> this musical passion has spread to his children, which led them and him to the School of Rock Calgary South in Douglasdale. So, yeah, the first the thing, <laughs> so the first question I wanted to ask you, Paul, is what got you into your profession within the music industry and how did that lead you to the School of Rock? Well, I'll say that um, when I first started playing music, I think I was six years old. Now, I wouldn't say I was playing music in, by any stretch of the imagination. But by the time I was 12, I, was, I had that little guitar. Where is it? Right there. That little guitar right there is my first guitar I started learning on. And it's like it's still got stickers on there from the trying to figure out what notes were what. And I, when I was in grade five, I thought, I'm going to be a rock star. And that was all I wanted to do is be a rock star. And um, my influences were like Jimmy Page, Led Zeppelin, Van Halen, who I just heard, Eddie Van Halen passed away today. Anyway. Um, what? Yes. Oh, yeah. I didn't up. know that. 65, yeah, he can't, throat cancer. Oh, wow, that's, um, that's awful news. Wow. Well, I know, for me, it's a shock, too, as a guitar player. He was one of my big influences. Huh. Uh, and um, so anyway, I um, knew it when I was six years old, too, that I wanted to be in the movie business. And I pursued that path, ended up at CTV doing news, which is not fun at all. Anyway, um, from there, through various connection stuff, I ended up editing and doing um, some freelance stuff. And I got hooked up with a couple of guys who were doing a lot of um, entertainment stuff. And really, I've done so many commercials and projects now in the entertainment industry as far as the TV side of it is concerned. But through that, I kept playing music and never stopped. I mean, I was gigging up until uh, relatively recently. We still kind of gig, but not as much as we used to. I was doing, you know, two or three gigs a month and um, playing my guitar a lot and stuff. Now I play keyboard, as you can see back there, too. Um, it's a long story behind that as well. And when did School of Rock start, Paul? So then um, my oldest son, Jeremy, um, he, wanted to, he was, wanted to play drums. And he started playing drums in a jazz band um, in school. But they were, you only go so far with that, I think. And then the first School of Rock opened up on 17th Avenue. And so he went there. And that's where he first met Maddie, too. And um, I watched these guys and these kids play. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. The um, incredible abilities that these kids were coming up with so quickly was just blowing me away how good they were. And I thought, I got to be involved with this somehow. So then I started talking to the school, um, which is based out of Philadelphia um, and Chicago. So I started talking to them about possibly doing another location in Calgary. And that's where School of Rock Calgary South came from. Oh, and it was um, incredible, uh, been an incredible experience. Listening to these kids every week, every day, make music from the first note to the show that we do, the concerts that we do. It's just incredible to see. And I think one of the things that music does for a lot of children is gives them an identity, gives them a place to be, gives them a safe place to be, um, gives them a group of friends, or as some of our kids call it, a family. Like it's funny how someone will draw a picture and say, this is my family. And it's all these guys in their band. And, it, you know, and that band changes from time to time, but it's just great to see that this is their family. It's more than just you know, kids getting together. It really is quite a, a great experience. Really, really enjoy it. So. And even from the name alone, you know, uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you to elaborate on it a little bit, but, you know, <clears throat> School of Rock just sounds so much more fun than the classical conservatory at, at you know, whatever university. Um, so I, I, I just love the idea of that, that it sounds fun from the beginning. What, what, uh, do, what, what is it? typical um uh like how do people get started at school rock what does it look like well i mean the first thing i would say is when kids come in the door 
they're surrounded by, if you take a look at pictures on our website, you'll see you're surrounded by music memorabilia. You're surrounded by music related stuff. The whole vibe in there is really quite cool. And we strive, strove really hard to build a place that people walked into and went, this feels great. This feels like home. And then sometimes the music that comes out from behind the doors isn't exactly musical, but these kids are still learning too. Mm-hmm. The, um, when you first go into school and you, and you get past that, we start to take people on a tour and you get into our backstage area. We've got a full stage built out. We've got LED lights everywhere. We've got PA systems. We've got instruments on the walls and everywhere. We actually just built a recording studio now too. Awesome. Starting to teach the kids about that aspect of it as well. And I think when you start to look at like the younger kids from, we we start as early as five years old, sometimes four. And to see, I mean, they're not, some of them aren't banging on instruments right off the bat, but what they're doing is exploring music and starting to get um, the rudiments, the basics together. So that by the time they go, you know, I want to be a guitar player, I want to be a singer, I want to be a keyboard player, drummer, whatever. They really know that's what they want to do, as opposed to, you know, a lot of parents will say, well, I'm starting junior and piano lessons because that's all I know, or violin lessons. A buddy of mine, when I was going to school when we were kids, he, he was forced to take accordion. Man, that guy hated it, hated it. Hated it. <laughs> and guess what? He went to guitar shortly after that. But his mom and dad hated the guitar, so it's this weird battle. You don't see that as much anymore, though. Mm-hmm. You know, accordion just doesn't fly off the shelf the same way the guitar does. So. <laughs> Oh, fair enough. That's cool. And how many kids are at, at at your school of rock? How many students do you have there? Well, with COVID, we kind of reduced the fair amount, but um, we're getting back up to, we were at 175, 180 in March. Oh. And now we're at about 130, I think. So we're getting back up there. And it's just a great experience. Every time you walk in there, you hear what's going on and you go, wow, this is so cool. Um, most of the reviews we get are, you know, four or five stars, you know, and it's not, off, not often we get below that. Part of, part of that is because we also, um, we're not there um, necessarily to, you know, be profit mongers. What we are there for is music. We want the kids that, who want to be there to be there. We want to ensure that they get there and make it there somehow that we don't want to have to have them feel like um, that we're there just for the money. We're there mm-hmm. for the music. And that's really, I think, what helps this sets us apart from other music studios as well, that we really um, focus on that a lot. I mean, we try to anyway. That's our that's our main goal is to make everybody um, realize that they're there for music. And Paul, can you tell us a little bit more about the programs? I understand you have performance programs at different levels, and then on top of that, there's also a house band. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. So we start off with, like I said earlier, the um, four, five, and six year olds. That's our rookies program, and that's really exploratory. So the kids get exposed to everything drums, percussion, guitar, bass, keyboard, singing. And depending on what level they go to, they will start to um, gravitate as they get older to a particular instrument. Um, Then after that, they graduate into a program called Rock 101. And that program, again, is can be very beginning. Some of the kids have never played a note, but they come in, that's eight years old to 12 years old in that range. And they start to grow and play their, their instrument and then we start to do um, full-on concerts with that age group too. It might not be the same level as you see in our performance group, but they um, do like four or five songs set at the end of our season. And the parents just go, wow, I can't believe little Johnny can play that good. And then we graduate them from that to either a junior performance, which is a um, kind of a cross between Rock 101, Rock 101 age group and performance age group. And it's like 12 to 13, 12 to 15. And that's kind of like an upper musical. So if you're 11 years old and you're really good on your guitar, you go into junior performance. And if you're not so good, you'll stay in Rock 101. And then the junior performance eventually leads into performance, which is the uh, 13 to 18. And these kids do a really, really good job of learning how to play their instruments and play the songs. In fact, our last concert we did in September with one of our groups was all instrumental music. And to be able to play instrumental music in front of a crowd and get them to be reactive is much harder than it is if you just got a, a vocalist and you're doing songs because parents just having to sit there and go, this song, this song has got to mean something to me now because it's not um, Rick Springfield, it's not Brian Adams, it's not something I know. They were doing like dream theater stuff. And, wow. But they were able to pull it off to the point where everybody in the crowd was like, wow, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a testament to them as students, but also to our programs and how we teach them and that stuff. 
Of course, and and then how they ultimately perform that as well. Yes, yes you know. Absolutely. Uh, do you find that uh, your students gravitate to some of the, the the more classic material that you know we might have grown up on, or that we were drawn to as kids? Do you find that that's kind of universal? Some of the classic things that people get into. Um, do you find that that your students these days are into that as well? Well, I find it's kind of like there's sort of two roads there. There's the kids that are really interested in that. And then there's the other kids that have never even heard of some of that stuff. And they just do, all they want to play is technical death metal. Mm -hmm. And that's all, all they want to do is like this stuff that your moms and dads are like, what on earth is this music? <laughs> and um, I think a lot of them really do appreciate, um, when we talked about Van Halen, we talked about um, um, Rush, we talked about um, some of those bands, Metallica and stuff. And these kids start to um, be able to gravitate a little bit to, to that. Right now, uh, we're working on with our kids um, the soundtracks from Guardians of the, of the Galaxy. And if you look at that, you're seeing stuff from the 60s and 70s, and hardly, hardly any of it's like rock rock. A lot of it's like, you know, um, funkadelic kind of disco almost stuff. And it's, it's really not, there's not a lot of distortion guitars going on. There's not a, not a lot of great guitar solos happening. But there's some great music. There's some great funk um, elements. There's great chords, great, um, great singing, great melodies. And I think as a musician, if you can learn how to play a, a funky guitar part or a reggae part, even if you love heavy metal and that's all you want to do is just play metal. If you learn how to do that, someplace down the line, somebody's going to say um, in, a, in whatever band you're in, let's work on this song and go, yeah, I've got the perfect thing for that. Actually, my son was talking about that with his jazz training and they were doing a Metallica song. He started playing jazz style. And it's like, wow, I mean, that totally took that song in a whole other direction mm -hmm. and just was neat. Or even just taking them... Um, and I'll use him again as an example. There's a drum beat that you learn in jazz that you don't hear in rock. And he was just trying to implement that in some of the beats he was playing and just made people's heads kind of go, that just sounds different and makes it a little bit more unique as opposed to everybody just doing a straight four on the floor kind of thing. Right. So yes, right. I think the classics are definitely influencing a lot of that kind of stuff. In fact, we use a thing called Song First in the school. And basically the idea behind the Song First is that we will teach you how to play TNT by ACDC, which is a classic song. It's a simple song, it's an easy song. But when you learn, when we teach you how to do that, while we teach you how to play the note on the third fret and, or the fifth string or whatever it is, we will start to teach you the theory behind it, but we won't bog you down in all that theory. We just learn the song. Now you know how to play the song. Okay, well, that's um, now you're playing a pentatonic minor scale or whatever it might be. Now you're playing a major scale or whatever it might be. So, whatever song you're working on, we work to focus on the song first. Then we get to the theory behind it after you've learned it. If you're playing a uh, crazy train, you realize you're playing a major riff that's using all the notes in the major scale. That's quite a neat thing to say. Well, I can play this riff now, which is a cool riff from a song that's a pretty cool song. But then now you're saying, okay, that's got all the notes in the major scale. Every single one of them in that major scale. Like, how cool is that? Now, now you've learned something musical, I think, which is really quite neat. So that's kind of that song first idea to you. Right. And then bringing it back and tying it all together. That's, that's really important. That's very cool. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think awesome. that's really the, our success for when you look at a music school overall, that really is the basis of our success, mm -hmm. that whole thing. So. And Paul, can you tell us a little bit more about the house band and how that differs from the performance group? Yeah, so our house band, which is really quite neat, it's, um, I want to say it's the best of, our, of the best of our kids. And um, these kids um, really want to be there. They want to um, do more rehearsals, learn more songs, really put more effort into it. And they get rewarded by playing, you know, we were able to play the Coke stage two years in a row. Uh, we would have played this year too, except of course COVID canceled us because uh, we were invited back. We played the CFL festivities down at the um, Stampede Grounds. We played Party in the Park last year with uh, um, Vince Neal with Styx with um, Tuke, uh, who also did a static shift. So we, um, these kids are able to rise to that level of playing because they get the extra rehearsal, because they get the extra songs, they get the extra stuff. Um, plus they have the interest to do it. This isn't just um, um, band class. This is um, really being a musician. Um, they get to experience some backstage stuff. They get to experience a lot more of that kind of thing. So the house band really is kind of the cherry on top of the cake, as it were. So. That sounds cool. Um, Paul, could, could I ask you to talk a little bit about some of your like peripheral music work? That you've done, uh, like say some of the the, the work you've done on, on on the the We Will Rock You musical and then the the Foreigner uh, jukebox hero. What what was your role uh, in those organizations? 
So basically what I end up doing is handling all their media stuff. I'm creating their radio commercials, their TV commercials, um, any of the uh, sizzle reels that get used. So for uh, We Were Rocky, for example, all, almost all the commercials you saw, whether you're in LA, New York, Chicago, Calgary, uh, Regina, were all done by me here in Calgary. Wow. And um, just sent out. And I've been doing that for, you know, a number of years with this group. Um, and just being associated with that was really quite neat. And um, listening, obviously, to great music like the Queen stuff really helps to um, give your appreciation of music that much more. Because those guys were brilliant musicians. Like Freddie Mercury is such an incredible singer. Mm -hmm. But to see this done, you know, it's musical theater. Um, it's all the Queen songs. Um, Brian May from Queen was actually here in town working with the band, with the local bands, with their local kids, or they weren't kids, but the local musicians that were playing in that group. Um, he's only here for a couple of days, I think. But it just was neat to see that um, these musicians got that level of, hey, this is how I play that song kind mm -hmm. of stuff, which to me is also really quite neat. And the Foreigner one um, is still kind of a work in progress, but we've been working on that for the last couple of years. So that's really quite neat. Um, how did you get into that sort of work? I, um, I, I, I'm sure that there's a number of listeners of ours that are curious about, like I said, this kind of these kind of peripheral jobs that are in the industry, but they're not just like being yes. an artist, you know? Um, um, how, how did you find how did you find that work? How did you get into it? Well, we'll go right back to when I was 18 years old. When I was 18 years old, um, I started playing in a band with these two girls. And um, we were called Evening Unfair. We had, um, I think that's in my bio as well, the uh, four or five songs in the university radio, which was Sony as well. And through that relationship, um, one of the girls worked for one of the promoter, local promoters in town. And I ended up being a roadie on, you know, trooper shows and um, some of like um, Thug and the Slugs and some names you probably never heard of. John Lee Hooker was another one. So but through that relationship, I got to know the guy who was the promoter and he is the promoter of all this stuff to this day. So I've just stayed in contact with him and been working in that world for you know, the last 25 years, I guess. So I think um, a lot of it's just, you know, right place, right time, um, getting to know the right people. Also being able to say, this is something I want to do. And because I want to do that, I'm going to reach out to that person and say, I want to do that. Can I do that? And you're going to get a yes or a no or a maybe. If you get a maybe, that kind of gets you in the door. If you get a yes, you go in the door. If you get a no, the next time you ask somebody for something, you just get close to a yes. And that's kind of the way I've always looked at it. And for me to say, well, um, I'd really like to be involved in you know, a bigger production like this. It's just a matter of staying in contact and being able to make those uh, relationships count and be able to take advantage of the people, not advantage, but take advantage of the situation to say, well, I'm going to make sure that they know that I'm still here. And I still want to be able to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. In fact, let's talk about that. Um, that same group of people were, um, are putting together a promotion called Rise Up. I think it's out in the airwaves now. And it's a uh, fundraising thing for the arts community, for all those people that are working, for all those people that don't have um, their jobs that normally worked in venues and theaters doing live entertainment, whether it's theater or music. So anyway, we were pretty, we were, I was asked to produce a commercial by that same group of people. And I did it for free. In fact, I wrote the music that's in there as well and recorded it, so it's also playing on there. So that's also being able to tie now my musical into my video side of things as well. So I think that's, again, being able to stay in that whole circle of things and trying to stay involved in that kind of stuff, if that makes right. sense. It does. And you just happen to have a specific set of skills that you could you could apply, you know, and, and, and that gave you um, some flexibility there, I guess, in what you're able to offer. Absolutely. I mean, that really was my career for many, many years was doing video production. And yeah, that meant the boring work as well as the exciting work. So when you get to do, like we did Pink Floyd Experience, we rented the Centrum in, in uh, Red Deer for like four or five days and shot a bunch of stuff for commercial and stuff. This is about 10 years ago. And we wanted to have a Burning Man because Pink Floyd has a Burning Man motif. So we rented him or we bought him a uh, um, mannequin. We sprayed him, dressed him up, sprayed him with stuff that would allow him to burn but not melt. And we just got tons and tons of shots of this burning guy in the century of stuff. So being able to do the fun stuff like that, as opposed to the uh, safety video for the oil and gas company, which is <laughs> That's, you know, that, that was that was my career for a long time. So, uh huh. I'm wondering, Paul, if you can tell us a little bit more about your experience as a working musician and playing in bands, and also kind of how you've seen the music scene change and adapt um, since you started as a young musician. And if you think young musicians today are facing unique challenges that you never had to deal with. 
Well, that's interesting because when I first started playing music and got into bands and stuff when I was 18, 17, 18, the uh, gig world was six days a week. So you'd get a gig, you'd play Tuesday through Saturday. So you had Sunday to drive to your next gig, or Monday through Saturday, I guess. They used to call those back sixes, right? Yeah, they, and you had, you had your front three, which was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Sometimes you'd have a front three, then you'd have a back three in a different place. So your back three was um, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was your front three. Then you had your back three. With, and depending on the gig routing, you hoped that you didn't have to be, you know, in Kamloops into Saskatoon overnight because that was a long drive to get there. And then throughout the years, we kind of saw that kind of dwindle to the point where they stopped doing the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday stuff. And then they just started doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then that started to shrink to just Friday, Saturday. And then now we're with COVID and stuff that kind of almost all vanished. But I think it, um, the music industry is kind of cyclical too. So it kind of depends on the types of venues that are out there and who's going to the venues. Because as musicians, uh, we can't um, do our job if there's nobody in the audience. So if people don't want to see live music, then, how, then we can't get a gig because nobody wants to hire a band. But I'm seeing now with, with this whole lockdown business that when a band does get out and start playing, the crowds start to come back out. We played an outdoor thing a couple of weeks ago, and there was lots of people that wanted to come in, and, and people were all socially distanced and everything, but um, we were able to still do this gig, and it, may, it meant a lot to the guy who owned the place because now he got business coming in. And we talk about um, gigging as a musician. Your job is to sell beer, is to sell food. That's your basic role in the bar band scenario, I guess. And most of my uh, playing life was in that sort of arena, as it were. Um, I wish it was in your big arena, though. Uh, what else can I say? The, um, these days, too, you see a lot of singles and duos, which also help. I think it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's great for the single and duo to get out there and get their, their, their gigs playing, but it also takes away from the bigger three, four, five-piece bands that are able to, that want to play and stuff. I think it's very hard in this world to make a living as a musician, particularly at a local level. But having said that, do you guys know who plays with Slash? Uh, somebody from town here? Well, one guy's from a small town called Lanigan, Saskatchewan. He used to live in Calgary, he worked in Calgary for a long time, Todd Kearns. Another oh. guy's from Innisfail. Uh, another guy's from Regina. Another guy's really? from Winnipeg. These are all Canadians that are down in the U.S. doing really, really well and making money at it. These are all guys that I played with on the circuit back in the day. So I tell that story because um, these are people that were all local musicians playing in local bands, doing the bar scene, playing cover songs that made it to the next level where they can make their living playing. Not only make their living playing, but they get to play with a guy like Slash. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine being able to play with someone like that? Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And yeah, then... To have come from, you know, these familiar surroundings, it's, it's really good to hear that because, you know, you can always dream big and then these people have actually done it and been there, you know. Yeah, so how did they do that? I mean, that's that's a great question. I think that is yeah. really a good question. So, um, Corey Cherko, who's from Regina, um, I think he's actually from Moose Jaw. He plays with a singer named Shania Twain. And he's based <laughs> out of L.A. Look at him, he's from Moose Jaw. And he got his start by going to Vancouver. He was actually going to go into a computer, anima computer animation and he started working as a computer animator. But he thought, you know, I'm a musician too. So he started busking on the streets of Vancouver and so he was playing guitar, but he looked around and went, look at all these guitar players. What can I play that's not guitar? So I said, he's like, well, I know how to play fiddle. So he started playing fiddle. And guess what? The Vancouver Canucks were walking by, somebody from the organization saw this fiddle player, went, man, you're really good. I'm going to bring you into the building. So he started playing at the Vancouver Canucks games. And through that, he got a call from a guy in Toronto saying, I have an artist here that needs a fiddle player. Can you fly out tomorrow? He said, yeah, okay, no problem. He flew out to Shania Twain. He's been with her for 20 years. Huh. So I think as a musician, we have to always look around and say, what can we do? What can I do that's going to set myself apart from all the other guitar players that are out there? Even if, I, even if that's all I am as a guitar player, how can I become the guitar player that gets the call for that gig? And I, I think that's one of the things that I like to tell all our kids and all our students about is that don't give up on that. I mean, that is, I mean, being able to play music, you can do it as a living. I, I, can, I, can, meet you, I can introduce you to these guys. These are real people. These are guys from Canada. These are from small town Alberta, small town Saskatchewan. They're playing major shows all over the world. This can be done. This is not um, something that can't be done. This is great. So I think it's really cool that 
that avenue still is there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's encouraging. That's very cool. Um, do you think that it's important for young musicians these days to uh, young musicians these days to be familiar with uh, with recording with audio and video recording programs such as uh, uh, you know Final Cut or or GarageBand or or all those sorts of programs. Uh, you must you must use utilize those sorts of things in your career uh, often. And and do you think it's a, a valuable tool for young musicians? Absolutely. I think um, things like YouTube, for example, Vimeo, um, SoundCloud, all those things are tools that we as musicians, I think particularly the young kids now, are looking at going, how do I get exposed? It used to be that you signed a record deal and they, and they, they took you out and then they hopefully they made a record and hopefully it sold. Who buys records? What was, what was the last song you bought? You probably can't even remember. Um, I can't remember. Because what do I do? I turn on you know, Spotify or turn on U uh, YouTube music or turn on Apple music and I stream it all. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do I as a musician get that music out there to get it heard? Um, and really by taking advantage of things like uh, YouTube, for example, SoundCloud, any of those things, um, and understanding how to not only just record your own stuff and what gets involved in recording your own stuff, but being able to make the music videos, being able to make any of that kind of content that your fans will like to get, you know, more than a couple hundred views on YouTube is when you start to create a following. Then what you have to be prepared for is to follow up with that. Okay, I've done a video now. So what can I do with that video? I'm trying to get, then I got to do another video. And I got to do some more. So I got, you just got to keep the content coming. And I tell you what, if you're going to hire me to do that stuff, it's going to cost you a lot more than if you're going to do it yourself. But having said that, you know, you, you, at there's certain times you say you have to hire a professional because you're going to get a level of professionalism that you can't do on your own until you've learned it. But at the same time, there's so many great tools out there. You grab your iPhone and you can shoot incredible video now. It's an unbelievable what you can shoot on there. Compared to even five years ago, it's unbelievable. Some friends of mine are shooting a movie right now with an iPhone. It's like, what? Isn't that amazing? Oh, and I think it, it is amazing how far it's come. Just this little thing that we used to have, have to have so much gear for to replicate the same role. Well, technology really has given um, everything back to the creators. And I think as, um, especially young kids being able to take advantage of that. How many YouTubers out there are 65 years old? Not many. How many are 18, 19, lots? And those are the ones that are doing the thing. And I think um, as a musician in Calgary, how do you get it to be discovered in Nashville, in LA? Um, he's got to keep putting this stuff out there. There's a girl from Moose Jaw who caught the eye of Corey Cherko, who now he's kind of promoting her stateside. So all it takes is that one little connection from somebody who say, oh, I like what you're doing, and then kind of push that out there. If you get an influencer that can say, check out, you know, Maddie's great song here, then all of a sudden, boom, like, you're off to the races, you know, that's, that's how quickly it can happen. Mm -hmm. And I think another example is Billie Eilish, her and her brother Phineas, what they created in his bedroom. I mean, a lot of those, you know, trial and error until they figured it out, but once they figured it out, well, first of all, you have to know which buttons to push, which knobs to turn to do the right thing. You also have to have good songs, which they also have. Mm -hmm. Good songwriting skills. So the whole package happened to be for them. Mm -hmm. But you got to start somewhere. So you just got to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, Some definitely. awesome advice. Jory, do you have any other specific questions for Paul? I do. I have one. Yeah. Um, and from you, we're obviously on the veteran side of things compared to our, uh, you know, our audience here. But I'd like to ask you, what are some things that you receive? What are some what are some things you like about working with youth talent and, and young artists and young musicians? Well, I think that for me, I guess the first thing I like to say is I like to be able to give back, however that is, um, whether it's helping with, you know, a music video, whether it's helping with a song with it's helping with, you know, figuring out a songwriting portion or just helping them get the courage to get up on stage. Um, I try to use as many contacts that I have. You know, that's how we got to Coke Stage. That's how we got to CFL or, or the CFL Festival. We got to see the YYC Awards as well. All three people that I know. And I was leveraging all those contacts, not for me, but for the kids because I want them to be able to go, man, what an experience I had. Even if they never be play another note of music in their lives, they go, I played on that Coke stage. How many musicians want to play on that stage? It's unbelievable. So I think being able to give back for me is number one. I think number two um, 
hearing this progression of music because for a while it seemed like music was kind of, I don't want to say dead, but um, how many great guitar heroes were there? I mean, there wasn't that many guys that you would say great guitar heroes. So who are we striving for? But then as you start to hear these young kids talking and talking about bands that I'd never even heard of before. And they're talking about musicians I'd never heard of before because they weren't part of my little circle of music. But then I get exposed to that as well. And being able to hear these kids say, oh, I want to play like so-and-so, he's my idol or whatever. Then you start to listen, you go, wow, that guy is an amazing musician. And to see that these kids are being influenced by that and helping them to go along that path to be able to get their chops up so they can be a better musician. I think for me to be able to hear them play that song that was done by their favorite artist really is a big thing, really, really quite neat as well. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's a great answer. I think that uh, I really admire what you're doing and, and how you're, you're, you know, you're helping the whole scene because these are, these are the, the future artists of, of our Canadian music landscape, you know, and uh, I just, you're doing a wonderful, wonderful thing there, Paul. So please keep it up. Well, I try. I mean, that's all I, I want to be able to give back. And that's, I think, you know, and a lot of my business partners are interested in that too. And that's how we got be able to play things like party in the park and see some of these other gigs that were bigger, higher profile is through the, um, these guys believing what we're doing as well. We're not mm -hmm. just a music school. I think we are um, giving kids a musical experience that's unlike anything else. So mm -hmm. really, that's kind of sums it up, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Paul. And if oh, I just wanted to ask, if you could give one piece of advice to young musicians, what would you say to someone who's just starting out? Well, there's so many things, but I think the thing that I always like to think about is um, don't give up. Just keep playing. If you play five minutes a day, that's one song, one song a day. Play that one song a day, um, and next thing you know, you'll be you'll be you'll be better and better, because you go through life in music as um, peaks and valleys and plateaus. When you hit that long plateau, man, as a guitar player, as a musician, you're like, I can't learn anything new. I can't get better. But all of a sudden, you hear a song or a chord or something or a progression. You go, oh, that's really cool. And you learn it. And that takes you back up again. So life is in music, as a musician is these um, getting over these plateaus. And and I just tell I told a kid last night who's leaving. He's brand new to the, he just bought a guitar. I said, play one song a day, one song a day, and you'll, you'll get there. And that's really kind of, I think, I don't want to say that's the secret sauce, but it's certainly in there. So. Wonderful advice, I think. Thank you, uh, Paul, where can, where can uh, our listeners find out more about School of Rock uh, in general, and then, and then also um, your location in particular? Well, schoolrock.com, of course, is the, the main website address. And we are, I think, Calgary South slash schoolrock.com. But once you get on the main site, it gives you all the information about it. And regardless of which location you end up at, um, all, all the programs are more or less the same. The instructors are all quality. That's the other thing I was going to mention, too, is our instructors are performing musicians. So we have to find, you know, when they have a gig, we have to find replacements for sometimes for them. Because these guys are actually the real deal. These aren't just guys that, oh, yeah, okay, I know how to play guitar so I can teach guitar. I actually play gigs and I know how to perform. We actually have a performance mentorship that we have as well. So then we try to bring these kids along. Okay, this is what you do when you're on stage. This is where you look, this is how you look. This is what you do. You got to do like all the moves and stuff too, right? Mm -hmm. So all that kind of stuff. So oh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. our website is probably our best thing for that. Okay. Wonderful. And social media too. Check us out on Instagram, uh, Facebook, even a little bit on Twitter. Does anybody use Twitter anymore? I, I don't know. <laughs> Maddie, you tell me. Um. I wouldn't say that a lot of people my age use Twitter, but I think there's a couple. Uh, yeah, there's a few of them. still. <laughs> okay. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning through all this. So it's wonderful. <laughs> Paul, Paul, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you so well, much, you. Paul, for all yeah, of your thank you advice. Very much. I appreciate you uh, thinking of us and getting us involved with this. This is awesome. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Well, take care. We'll, we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.